Inflammation and severe COVID vulnerability. Let's have a look. Hello everyone, Florian Heiser here and welcome to another episode of Heiser Says. Grab your stein of coffee because this is an interesting article or piece from the conversation that Rachel sent me that I thought, well, I definitely want to get through and I think a lot of other people would be quite interested. So inflammation, the key factor that explains vulnerability to severe COVID. Now, everyone is aware that the severity severity of the well, people being hit by COVID is quite dramatic. I had a look the other well last night at just the mild symptoms, and well, some people are going to sail through this and not even realize they've got it, or they'll just think it's a little cold or something inconsequential, or maybe they're just a bit tired from working too much. Whereas people having a severe reaction, it can be life threatening. It really can. And there's questions as to why there is this discrepancy. And here's one, well, one argument put forward that it's to do with inflammation. Now, this is of particular interest to us because one of the reasons why we went down this uh, ketogenic diet and path was because it addresses cellular inflammation. And let's have a look at this. And this is written by uh, Sheena Kurikshank. Professor of Biomedical Sciences at the University of Manchester. And here's an interesting one, a thing I want to highlight to everyone's attention. A disclosure statement. A disclosure statement. I quite like the conversation that they're doing this. It shows you the difference between academic quality work and normal work. They're actually putting a disclosure statement up. I'm used to that because of all the low-carb, um, down-under lectures and series that we watch. They'd always start up and put out their disclosure statement, like, oh, I published this book or I received royalties from this, or I've got no disclosures. So she does not work for a consult, own shares in, or receive funding from any company or organization that would benefit from this article and has disclosed no relevant affiliations beyond their academic appointment. Now, wouldn't it be good if news.com, every of these news articles, news you know, media organizations that are pushing, that are lobbying for to force the government to make Google pay them money, be required to do this? Wouldn't that lead to perhaps more integrity in journalism? What do you think? I know that's off topic, but I think we need to advocate for that in all, all journalism. So I'm going to have a shot of coffee. And Rachel's, Rachel's told me this is a rather technical piece. So let's, let's do our best to go through it. The severity of COVID-19 can vary highly, hugely. In some, it causes no symptoms at all. In others, it's life-threatening with some people particularly vulnerable to its very severe impacts, and that's the comorbidity factors. The virus disproportionately affects men and people who are older and who have conditions like diabetes and obesity. That's the thing. Being overweight is a comorbidity factor that isn't really discussed in the media at all. Is it because we've got this political correct world where fat shaming now is, is frowned upon? Is this our punishment? You know? A punishment for for not um, telling people to lose weight in the UK and other Western countries ethnic minorities have also been disproportionately affected while many factors contribute to how severely people are affected including access to health care occupational exposure and environmental risks such as pollution it's becoming clear that for some of these at-risk groups it's the the resp response of their immune system inflammation that explains why they get so sick specifically we're seeing that the risks associated with diabetes obesity age and sex are all related to the immune system functioning functioning irregularly when confronted by the virus so inflammation can go too far a common feature for many patients that get severe covid is serious lung damage caused by an overly vigorous immune response this is characterized by the creation of lots of inflammation, uh, inflammatory products called cytokines, the so-called cytokine storm. Cytokines can be really powerful tools in the immune response. They can stop viruses reproducing, for example. However, some cytokine actions, such as helping bring in other immune cells to fight an infection or enhancing the ability of these recruited cells to get across blood vessels, can cause real damage if they're not controlled. This is exactly what happens in a cytokine storm. Many white blood cells create cytokines, 
but specialized cells called monocytes and macrophages seem to be some of the biggest culprits in generating cytokine storms. When properly controlled, these cells are a force for good and can detect and destroy threats, clear and repair damaged tissue, and bring in other immune cells to help. However, in severe COVID, the way monocytes and macrophages work misfires, and this is particularly true in patients with diabetes and obesity. I'll need another shot of coffee. So glucose fuels damage. Diabetes, if not controlled well, can result in high levels of glucose in the body. A recent study showed that in COVID macrophages and monocytes respond to high levels of glucose with worrying consequences. The virus that causes COVID, SARS-CoV-2, needs a target to latch onto in order to invade our cells. Its choice is a protein on the cell surface called ACE2. Glucose increases the levels of ACE present on macrophage and monocytes, helping the virus infect the cells that should help be helping kill it. Wow. That's, that's fascinating. Once the virus is safely inside these cells, it causes them to start making lots of inflammatory cytokines, effectively kick-starting the storm. And the higher the levels of glucose, the more successful the virus is in replicating inside the cells. Essentially, the glucose fuels the virus. So, and the higher the levels of glucose, I'm repeating this, the more successful the virus is at replicating inside the cells. Essentially, the glucose fuels the virus. Now, here's the thing. Blood glucose levels are something that I've, I've been monitoring for some time. You know, I've got a little kit here to, to monitor it, try and address it to ensure, to ensure that uh, I don't get it too high. And you can manage that. You can manage that in your day-to-day -day just with your diet. And what, what, what do you think they'd be give, hooking up people to in the hospital to feed them, to keep them, you know, oh, their glucose levels are too low. Oh, you need to eat. Here, we'll give you this drip. Wow. But the virus isn't done yet. It also causes the virally infected immune cells to make products that are very damaging to the lungs, such as reactive oxygen species. And on top of this, the virus reduces the ability of our immune cells, lymphocytes, to kill it. Obesity can cause high levels of glucose in the body, and similar to diabetes, affects macrophage and monocyte activation. Research has shown that macrophages from obese individuals are an ideal place for SARS-CoV-2 to thrive. So other risks tied to inflation. Inflation, sorry, inflammation. <laughs> I've been talking too much about economics, guys. Although inflation is a risk. The same sort of uh, inflammatory pro profile that diabetes and obesity causes is also seen in some older people. Those over 60. This is due to a, phenomen a phenomenon known as inflammaging. Inflammaging is characterized by high levels of pro-inflammatory chitocines. It's influenced by a number of factors, including genetics, the microbiome, the, the bacteria, viruses, and other microbes that live inside your body, and obesity. Many older people also have fewer lymphocytes, the very cells that can specifically target and destroy viruses. This all means that for some older people, their immune system is not only poorly equipped to fight off an infection, but it is also more likely to lead to a damaging immune response. Having fewer lymphocytes also means vaccines may not work as well, which is crucial to consider when planning for a future COVID vaccine campaign. Another puzzle that has been worrying researchers is why men are so much more vulnerable to COVID. One reason is that cells in men seem to be, be more readily infected by SARS-CoV-2 than women. The ACE2 receptors that the virus uses to latch onto and infect cells is expressed much more highly in men than women. Men also have higher levels of an enzyme called TMPRSS2 that promotes the ability of the virus to enter cells. Yay, blokes! <laughs> 
Immunology is also offering some clues on the sex differences. Sex, sex differences? No, we can't. That, that doesn't exist in a, in a PC world, doesn't it? Huh. See, when reality hits the fan, all that PC rubbish goes out the window, doesn't it? It's long been known that men and women differ in their immune responses. And this is true in COVID. See, man flu is science. A recent preprint, research that has not yet been reviewed, has tracked and compared the immune response of SARS-CoV-2 in men and women over time. It found that men were more likely to develop atypical monocytes that were profoundly pro-inflammatory and capable of make, making cytokines typically of a cytokine storm. Women also, women also tended to have a more robust T-cell response, which is needed for effective virus killing. However, increased age and having a higher body mass index reversed the protective immunity effect for women. There you go. BMI, guys, being overweight, being obese. That, that needs to be discussed. Why do you think the numbers are so high in America? Okay. They're a bunch of fat bastards. Study, and, you know, it could also be, it could be, you know, Tofi. Thin on the outside and fat on the inside. Remember that. Studies like these highlight how different people are. The more we understand about these differences and vulnerabilities, the more we might consider how best to treat each patient. Data like these also highlights the need to consider variation in immune function and include people of varying demographics in drug and vaccine trials. So there we have it. I, that's quite Rachel's right to send this to me. I thought quite an interesting piece. And frankly, I'm going to take some steps to reduce my blood glucose level even further you know and there are ways to do that i'd I'd, rec I'd encourage you to look at low carb down under look at robert uh, lutzig you know go if you once you go down that food rabbit hole and the concerning th thing is the dietary guidelines coming from the government that are being fed to people in hospitals could exacerbate their glucose levels and well as we can see here fuel the virus what do you think, everyone? What do you think about this one? This is why when I had a viewer sent me saying, oh, get this needs to be gotten out. This this such and such a, a treatment uh, here is, a, is a, you know, a cure, a cure. These combination of these three things. The problem is there could be other unknown factors. Perhaps the patient he's treating has a low blood glucose level or they've got a genetic difference in their ability to handle food or their diet is different. If all those variables aren't taken into account, it may just be a confirmation bias that he's seeing or it may just be a coincidence or the levels of the drug that he's prescribing wouldn't be enough, particularly with the, with this lice drug that people are suggesting, hair lice drug, and that the getting the quantities in the blood would have to be so high they don't know what the consequences are. See, this is the thing. Sure, you can have a drug that's safe to use and it's measured and tested with a certain level in your bloodstream, but when you increase that level much higher that hasn't been tested, there's an element of risk, there's an element of unknown. That's where the danger lies. Very least, we, there needs to be more discussion around obesity, and that is a comorbidity factor that never is mentioned, never is mentioned. And if you want to look at ways to reduce your, your weight, there's ways to do it. I'd, I'd point you all to Low Carb Down Under and have a look at that website and some of the lectures from the doctors there, how they help trip people overcome diabetes and other things. Help me lose a whole lot of weight. And so there's my, there's my disclosure statement and bias there. So what do you all think, everyone? Let me know your thoughts and opinions in the comments below. Please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. If you're a fan and want to support the content I create here, there's a few ways you can. You can join the channel on YouTube or Patreon. You can support this channel by using any of our affiliate links at Amazon, eBay, Independent Reserve, or KuCoin. You can buy a merch from Heiser Says, use Gold Pass from the Perth Mint, or support us via PayPal. Take care, and I will see you all next time. Bye for now.